Father, we come before you. We thank you for your word. And as you're giving to your people how to run the civil society, we see our country, Lord, turning away from things that are right. And we clearly see the collateral damage that comes with it. So I pray that you would open up your word, Lord. You gave the nation of Israel these things to keep them separate. So that from them, Lord, in the fullness of time, you could bring forth your son, born of a virgin, to lay down his life for us. So Father God, please be with us now in this service and let your word come alive to every heart that's here and every heart that's listening. And draw us closer to you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now these are the judgments which thou shalt set before them, Moses. If thou buy a Hebrew servant, six years shall he serve, and in the seventh shall he go free or out free for nothing. We talked about it last week. You give them a severance package as they go out. We talked about Jubilee. We went through all that, so you guys are hopefully up to speed. If not, see last week. If he came in by himself, he should go out by himself. If he were married, then shall his wife go out with him. If his master has given him a wife and she hath borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. Many commentators agree that in the year of Jubilee they would also be released, but we have to wait for sure until we get to heaven because no one's around from that time to tell us. And if the servant shall plainly say, verse 5, I love my master, my wife, and my children. I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him unto the judges. And that word in the Hebrew there is Elohim, normally used to speak of God himself. But in this case, judges are called Elohim because they are rendering a verdict on behalf of Elohim. So they are often referred to. You'll hear Jesus say, you had you not read. They said, you are gods. This is what he's referring to. The judges are rendering judgments on behalf of God's law, of the Elohim. Bring him unto the judges. He shall also bring him to the door, unto the doorpost. So they confirm this publicly. His master shall bore through his ear with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. Again, most agree, goes out in jubilee, but we'll have to wait until we get to heaven. So verse 7. If a man sell his daughter to be a maid servant. Last week, remember, in Matthew 18, there was that man who could not pay a massive debt So the king ordered that he and his wife and his children would all be sold as well as his assets. He would be basically liquidated out. They would be put into servanthood or servitude. And the revenue from that servitude would then be applied towards their debts. So if you remember that, um, there can be instances where a daughter would be sold, in a sense, just as a son might be sold or the parents themselves. And so God now begins to put regulation around these things as well. And so here it talks about several issues. One... If a daughter, a man sell his daughter to be a maid servant or a handmaiden, she shall not go out as the men's servants do. So you can't give her the labor of a man as a woman. How many have heard of the book of Ruth? Okay, good. If you go back and look carefully at the book of Ruth, you will see that Ruth is among Boaz's servants, and he has the male servants who are harvesting, but he also has handmaidens, and they're involved in the harvesting process, but they're going behind and taking care of some of the additional things. And so you'll see that while they're in that process of harvesting, their work is divided by the type of labor that they do. So even in the book of Ruth, you can verify Boaz in dealing with his servants and his handmaidens handled things in that fashion as well. So you can see it there. But she shall not go out as the men's servants do. There's another thing that can happen. Marriages were arranged, generally. And so there are times where a daughter would be, quote unquote, sold or, quote unquote, given as a secondary wife. We call that a concubine. God's not instituting, in a sense, polygamy. But if you've read Genesis in chapter 4, you'll find there Lamech, and not the Lamech of Noah's Lamech, but Lamech, who took to him two wives, Ada and Zillah. And then there's one of the first instances of poetry where he's boasting about wounding a man and killing him after being hurt and, and all that. But it was among the ungodly that we see polygamy get started. 
And of course, it spread basically from that point. And then we had the flood. And after the flood, it started up again where there would be multiple wives that would be encountered. Often a case of a multiple wife or a secondary wife would be in, in the sense of if the first wife is infertile, not able to produce an heir because that's everything in Israel and in the Middle East. And so then a secondary wife would be taken and that wife would hopefully produce children uh, in the absence of the primary wife and, and on and on we go. We covered some of this back when we dealt with Abraham and Sarah where she was unable to bear and so they made this idea of let's let Hagar be the secondary wife and produce an heir. We know how that worked out. So that was another way that women could also, and the idea of sold is there's a bride price. So that could be another instance. Some fathers would prefer to have his daughter be quote unquote a secondary wife to a wealthy man as opposed to a primary wife to a man who might not make it or live at a subsistence level. These are decisions made by parents or fathers. So I simply point them out. If a man sell his daughter to be a maidservant, she shall not go out as the men's servants do. Verse 8, and if she please not her master. Now the words here are rach ayin, that's evil in his sight. Same thing used when there was a case for divorce. Some kind of thing has happened to where the husband says, I'm not having this. If he, she please not her master who has betrothed her to himself, then shall he let her be redeemed. There's a bride price given. That bride price could be then applied back. She could be redeemed back out to her family from this arrangement. To sell her unto a strange nation, he shall have no power. So if there's some kind of falling out, you can't just put her in the servanthood with the Gentiles. Seeing that he had dealt deceitfully or treacherously with him. Something has happened and she's not meeting his needs and so he decides to put her out. If he has betrothed her unto his son, again, arranging a marriage. So this woman is betrothed and there's a bride price and she's brought into this relationship. If he has betrothed her unto his son, he shall deal with her after the manner of daughters. So in the case of daughters, again, most would argue there, it seems that if their marriage isn't working out, then there would be the requirement of a divorce. She would be able to go back. And these are the specifics. One day we'll get in heaven, but these are the statutes that he gives to them. If he take him another wife, whether the man himself or for his son, if he take him another wife, her food, her raiment, wait a minute, another wife. For those of you who've been with us to Israel and those who are going in June, we go to the Bedouin tent experience. The people who've been there, you hear them go, experience. Why? You'll have an experience. It's fun. But often when we go, we will sit in a Bedouin's tent and they will present basically things about the Bedouins. We get a chance often to ask questions. If you're ever there, just so you know, you don't show them the bottom of your feet and you behave yourself and there's no, no belching and no other side, none of that. That's all, that's in the Bedouin, that's just not good. So we're there and we're talking to this Bedouin and he had three wives and he was looking for the fourth. And he mentioned something about preferably around the age of 18. Yeah, right, the women are like, oh, you know, and I, we're guests, we're guests, Middle East, stop. And my wife was on this trip, and uh, she said to him, look, I have a question. He said, yeah, go ahead. She said, well, when you had your first wife and you married your second wife, I mean, how did that go with your first wife? And he said, quote, I'm saying quote, not me. Oh, it was great. Because after I got my second wife, my first wife started taking better care of herself, unquote. Do you hear the gasps? They were all female. My wife was like, she, she, she starts like, mm, I'm like, don't, don't, we're not, we're not having an international incident, the better intent. I'm not going to do it. It still goes on in the Middle East. They'd like to bring it here, two groups, the Mormons and the Muslims. God put rules around it. If you betroth her unto your son, you shall deal with her after the manner of daughters. She's a daughter now of the family. Better status. If he take unto him another wife, whether himself or his son, her food, her raiment, her clothing, and her duty of marriage, that's onal. Onal is basically cohabitation or what we would call conjugal rights. Love and affection being one. These things are all three to be provided. The food, the raiment, and the duty of marriage. They shall not, or he shall not diminish them. And if he do not these three, food, clothing, take care of her, and relational duty of marriage. If he do not these three unto her, look at verse 11, then shall she go out free 
That's it. Without money. So, if you need a campaign slogan, all three are go free. <laughs> it's very simple. She has rights. And if he fails to meet all three, she can bring him to the judges and say, hey, there's not all three. She goes free. So he put rules around this. Now, this brings up a bigger question. One that was asked a lot in the 80s. Should I stay or should I go now? <laughs> and I was watching this discussion between Elon Musk and, um, and Bill Maher. It came up as a clip on his subject matter. And they got into slavery and the Bible. And they're both sort of laughing like, well, the Bible is just, you know, it's apparently good with slavery. Well, clearly they haven't read it carefully. So the first place we have to go is Deuteronomy 23. Deuteronomy 23. We're going to be in verse 15. You shall not deliver unto his master the servant which is escaped from his master unto you. So if a slave runs away and he comes to your area, you don't turn him back. He shall dwell with thee even among you, and in that place which he shall choose in one of thy gates, where it liketh him best, and thou shalt not oppress him. So a slave is able to get away, they're able to come to this area, and it doesn't even specify if they're a domestic slave of somebody else within Israel, if they escape and they come to you, you give them sanctuary, safe harbor. So look at that for God's heart. They run away, you don't turn. The Gre the Gre in the Greco-Roman world, the Greeks and the Romans, if a slave escaped, you could pursue them anywhere you want, and if you caught them, you would brand them, many argue perhaps in the face, so it's obvious they're a runaway slave. And God says if there's a slave who comes to you and he's gotten free from his owners, then that's it. You give him safe harbor. You let him go. They've gotten their way out. Turn also, if you would, to 1 Corinthians 7. Last week we talked about in Revelation how that God will eventually judge slavery in Revelation 18, just as he's going to judge a whole lot of other things that are plaguing this world. But once he starts, it will not stop. But until it starts, sadly, many of these things continue. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, we just went through it not long ago. It took us three weeks because there's a lot in it. He said, verse 20, let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. Are you called being a servant or a slave is the idea? Care not for it. In other words, don't be concerned. But if you may be made free, use it rather. The idea is grab the opportunity. So if you can be made free, do it. So he just said in verse 20, let everybody abide in the same calling where he is. However, if you're a slave and you can get freedom, get out. Get out as fast as you can. If you can be made free, use it rather. For he that is called in the Lord being a slave or a servant is the Lord's freeman. So you have been emancipated by the blood of Jesus, and in the life that is to come, you will be free. Also, he that is called being free is Christ's servant. He paid for you with his blood. You belong to him. Ye are bought with a price. Look again the heart. Be not ye the servants of men. If you can get free, get out. Then there's also Philemon, just before the book of Hebrews. Some are tempted to call him Philemon, but it's Philemon. Just in case you meet him in heaven, which you be embarrassed. Philemon. The short answer is Philemon in a town where church has been planted, and I'll just keep it pretty to the point here, had a servant named Onesimus. And Onesimus took money, robbed from Philemon's household, ran for the hills, and escaped. It appears, perhaps in Rome, but somewhere he crosses the path of this guy named Paul. Paul shares the gospel with him, we think, in some fashion. He becomes a believer. As his life begins to change, his story comes out. Oh, I'm from such and such town, and I work for Philemon, and, you know, and there's his sons. And, and Paul says, I know them. Uh-oh. You got to go back. And the answer is, well, he'll probably kill me. So Paul writes a letter to Philemon, which is right here. Deals with a few issues. And then verse 18 gets to the point. If Onesimus has wronged you, let me help you out. He did. Or has owed you anything, he does. Put that on my account. 
I, Paul, have written it with my own hand. This is essentially a promissory note. I will repay it. I'll pay anything he stole from you. And he throws this in. Albeit, I do not say to you, Philemon, how that you owe unto me even your own self besides. You know that fact you're going to heaven, Philemon? God forgave your sins? In other words, <laughs> he may owe you a few bucks, but because we preached you, basically, you owe us your soul, right? We helped you get into heaven. No pressure. Yea, brother, let me have joy of you in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. Old King James were just overwhelming with joy. Having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto you, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. Wait a minute. You're telling me to forgive him? Yep. You're telling me to dismiss any debt? Yep. Well, I mean, what else could I give the guy? Freedom. Pastor, yeah, you still haven't given us a verse that we were hoping to see. Thou shalt not slave. True. There's also not a verse, thou shalt not gamble. But we do see an instance of gambling, and it's by the ungodly for the clothes of Jesus. It's not exactly a group I'd like to be in. And the collateral issues that go with gambling, greed, extortion, prostitution, all these other things that happen, the Bible's very clear about those. Same thing with slavery. What it does say is you shall love your neighbors yourself. Whatsoever you would have men do unto you, that do you also unto them. That's what Jesus taught us in the Sermon on the Mount. If you wouldn't like to be a slave, enslaved, why on earth would you enslave someone else? If you were a slave and you would like to be free, why on earth would you then not free one who's enslaved to you? And as that gospel message, pray for those who persecute you. Do good to those who treat you evilly in a sense. As that began to work into the heart of the church, over time, slavery again eventually was eradicated and dying out in the Roman Empire. What happened was the hearts had to change. And as the hearts started to change, the behavior of the society started to change. As the Christians rescued those thrown into the street who were sick, eventually it brought forth hospitals. As the Christians rescued the children exposed to the elements, infanticide, and brought them in and raised them, that eventually gave rise to orphanages. Many of the social services today to help those who are oppressed or misused came out of essentially the work of the gospel going through the church of God as they served in the world they lived in. So eventually it did go by the wayside. Now, however, there is still slavery today in the world, if you're not aware. There is a trafficking in the country here, sex trafficking, which is its own form of slavery. So if you find someone trying to get out of that, get them out of it. Help them. There are ministries that you guys help support that do that. But these are the things that were going on. So go back again to Exodus 21. If they do not these three, then they shall go out free. Now, there's some more about this, but we've got to keep plugging our way through. Now, do you remember back in chapter 20, verse 13, we learned you shall not murder is what it said. Yes? You remember we went through all those different permutations of intentional and accidental death and involuntary manslaughter? Yes? Any hands? We'll do it again. No, keep going. All right, just want to make sure. So here's your quiz. Having learned that with us, He that smiteth a man so that he die, muth, shall surely be put to death, muth, muth. So in other words, here, premeditated. There was intent behind this. You wanted to take someone out. Fine. That was classic definition of murder. Premeditated. You wanted to kill them. You killed them. You're a murderer. Verse 13. If a man lie not in wait, no premeditation. But God deliver him into his hand. You're rolling rocks off your hill or off a cliff and you caught your neighbor. Ah, sorry, Fred. (laughs) Or again, cutting wood or whatever the case may be. If a man deliver him into his hand or God deliver him into his hand, this is no premeditation, accidental death. Then will I appoint thee a place whither he shall flee. And they were called cities of refuge. Nice, most of you got it. That's where you go. Verse 14, but if a man come upon, or a man come presumptuously upon his neighbor, what did we just establish? Intent and motive. If a man come presumptuously upon his neighbor, 
to slay him, chreg, to kill or murder, with guile, deceit. Thou shalt take him from mine altar that he may die. There is no sanctuary for a murderer. You are to put them to death. Okay, so that was our review. Now, verse 15. He that smiteth his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. Ooh. I'm not going to ask you how many of you should be put to death for smiting your father or your mother. But this brings up an interesting discussion. Turn to Deuteronomy 21. Let's go there first. Deuteronomy 21. Deuteronomy 21, verse 18. If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father, or will not obey the voice of his mother, note the equality, and that when they have chastened him, so they've done the deal here, they've corrected him, tried to hold him accountable, and all the other things that you, know, you should be doing as parents, when they've chastened him, he will not hearken unto them. Then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him and bring him unto the elders of the city. Again, this is small villages and hamlets. They've been watching. Word gets out. It's not real hard to take him unto the elders of the city and to the gate of his place. And they shall say unto the elders of his city, this our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of his city shall stone him with stones that he die. And so shalt thou put evil away from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. Now, you see this, and some people are like, <gasps> but I have to tell you, back in 19, uh, let's see, 92, I finished up with the Bible college, and before we left to go to Russia, the Soviet Union collapsed, and then we, within June, we were there. So in the meantime, in California, if you have a master's degree and you pass the C best, which basically means, yep, two and two, four, yep, at least back then it was four, yep. They'd let you be a substitute teacher. And so I had a month-long substitute job, that our substitution job, because this teacher was out for a number of reasons. And, and when you're there that long, the kids start figuring out how to push your buttons and deal with you and all that. And so I had this one day I'm dealing with them. I'm like, you know what? If you guys were in Israel, they'd take you out and stone you. You can see all their little eyes, like, you know, 1990s, man, we can still get away with it. And so they asked, so I explained to them, you know, statute and rebellious, and they right, that's exactly what they did, you know? And, Stubborn, rebellious, we lay it out, and, and, and they're like, well, well, how did they do it? Did they put them against the wall so they're trying to like color pictures, or, or did they have them in a pit, or, you know? And the sad part was the lesson of stop being a punk. <laughs> right over their heads. All they wanted to know is, how do they do it? <laughs> how many of you parents would just idly grab your kids, take them to the elders of the city, and say, stone them? Now, I know you may have had that temptation at times. <laughs> but you understand, right? They won't listen to your voice. They won't listen to your wife's voice. They're basically rebellious in whatever fashion and even overtly just dangerous. You see, God's authority in the home were the parents. And if the children don't learn to respect the parental authority, they're not going to respect other authority either. You're teaching them essentially two very important things. One, how to hand them off to the civil society to be responsible, but two, also how to hand them off when they leave to be under God's authority. And yes means yes and no means no. There's some very important things being taught. And you've gotten to a point with this child here in this example in chapter 22 of Deuteronomy, or 21, where they have such disrespect for the parents of parental authority. You've chased them, you've tried to deal with them and all that. You bring them to the elders of the city. They are going to hear it as a case. They know what you've been dealing with as well, again, smaller community. And they realize that's it. Now, people will say, well, that's horrifying. They shouldn't do that to that child. Um, Here's the thought. I, it seems to be older. He's a drunken, a glutton. Everybody got that? Drunken, glutton. That seems to be older for one. If you don't want to be stoned by the elders of your city, perhaps you should listen to your parents or option two, move. Oh, yeah, they could do that. Yes, they could. Leave. 
because they know if you won't listen to the parental authority, it's only a matter of time until you have no restraint and no authority and you will be a danger to the community in some fashion. This was not undertaken lightly, but it was there as a recourse. So, okay, back to our chapter here. He that smites his father or his mother, that is the ultimate rebellion against their authority, shall surely be put to death. So, youths, if you don't want to be put to death, what do you not do? Attack your parents. If you attacked a stranger and they defended themselves and they killed you in that defensive, defensive act, right? You're learning in the bigger world. You know, we have little guys. Hey, look, when you bite your brother, see, um, you go out in the world, that's going to be assault and battery. might even be aggravated assault, and here's what's going to happen. So you're going to learn in our home not to do that. So when you get out there, you're not in jail. That's what you're teaching. Little lessons that you extrapolate out. Let me tell you what happens to you out in the world. So once again, it goes on. Verse 16. Listen, these are the rules for the people in Israel. He that stealeth a man, we have a term for that. Kidnapping, this side got it. He that stealeth a man and selleth him, what would you sell him into? Slavery. He that steals a man and sells him. Or, Second condition, if he be found in his hand, you're in the act of having abducted them but haven't fenced your property yet or your product, he shall surely be put to death. You steal someone to sell them into slavery, it is found out and verified, it's a death sentence. You steal someone and they're caught in your possession, it's a death sentence. Here's a crazy idea. If you don't want to be put to death for trafficking people, don't traffic them. One Bible college professor I had said, definitely no repeat offenders with this rule. That's how serious they took stealing someone to sell them or to abuse them in some fashion. Once again, don't do it in Israel or leave. Surely put to death. He that curseth his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. Note to self, not a good idea. Again, the idea of you rejecting the parental authority God has placed over you, and if you don't learn to obey their authority, the rest is going to go downhill from there. So again, the stipulation. If men strive together, <clears throat> good old-fashioned fight, and one smite another with a stone or with his fist, so some kind of fight breaks out, a guy's there and he's, he grabs a stone, it's kind of like brass knuckles without the brass, and start swinging and boom, they get into this fight and realize the person who grabs the stone may be the victim. But they get assaulted suddenly and they got to defend themselves. They reach around and, right, they go to defend themselves. So it could be the perpetrator or the victim. If two men strive together, one rises against another, the idea, and one smite the other with a stone or with his fist and he die not. So he got injured, but he's not dead. But keepeth his bed. If he rise again and walk abroad upon his staff, then shall he that smote him be nachach, and that is guiltless or innocent. Only, so in other words, a fight broke out, you defend yourself, or wherever the case may be, nobody died. Only, here's your repercussions. He shall pay for the loss of his time, lost wages. He shall cause him to be literally rafa rafa, thoroughly healed. So you get into a fight with someone, you injure him, they're bedridden for some period of time, you're on for the medical bills and all the restitution to keep him during his disability. So in other words, don't get into a fight. Stay away from it. If a man smite his servant or his maid with a rod, okay, we have to explain something. A club is a weapon of war. A rod or a staff is usually a slender kind of stick used by shepherds to close a gate or to get the sheep moving or whatever, keep something at bay or kind of prod or poke or whatever. Not normally used as, a, as an offensive weapon to try and take someone out. You, you're going to take something more serious if you're going to go try and wipe somebody out than your staff. You bring a sword, you bring a club, you bring whatever, a spear with a sharp edge. Um, but this is the idea of a staff, kind of like a common work item that they had over there. So if a man smite his maidservant or his man servant with a rod and he die under his hand he shall be sorely or surely punished see we live here in the west and we don't really understand how things kind of work in the east 
So let me give you a few examples here. Turn to Deuteronomy. Let's go to um, 25. Deuteronomy 25. How many of you are thinking, I don't ever want to go to the Middle East after? <laughs> Deuteronomy 25. Verse 1. If there be a controversy between men, imagine that, and they come unto judgment, they get hauled into the court, that the judges may judge them. Again, usually gate of the city, the elders, the overseers. The judges may judge them. Then they shall justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. And by the way, that's the way justice is supposed to work. We've lost some of that. And it shall be if the wicked man be worthy to be beaten. Look at this. That the judge shall cause him to lie down and to be beaten before his face, according to his fault by a certain number. Forty stripes may he give him and shall not exceed lest if he should exceed and beat him above these with many stripes, and then thy brother should seem vile or humiliated is the idea unto thee. And so you have an issue, you're brought before the judges, what you did was an outrage, and they assess not only in some cases restitution, but you're getting a good old-fashioned beating for being a bonehead. How many lashes do the Jews give? 39. Very good. Why 39? because they were so concerned they would go above 40, and the law says 40 or less, that they would always do 39. Okay. Turn to Acts chapter 5. This isn't just Old Testament. This stuff goes on in the New Testament. And you've read it, but you didn't really pay attention to it because you were focused on other issues going on in Acts chapter 5. The apostles have already been before the Sanhedrin once, so the man who was healed at the gate, beautiful. Now they're again preaching. God's doing some cool stuff. They throw him in jail for the night. The angel comes, lets him out of prison, goes, tells him, go preach again. So they go back in the temple. They start preaching. The Sanhedrin finds them, brings them back in front of the council, and they said this to them. They said, listen, we're the witnesses of Jesus. God raised them up. You killed them. And God gives his Holy Spirit, verse 32, to those that obey him. Well, they had had enough when they heard that. When they heard, verse 33, these things, they were cut to the heart and they took counsel to slay them. So they decided, kill them. How many have heard of Gamaliel? Oh, not as many hands. Gamaliel, very respected rabbi, stands up and says, guys, slow down. Just look, can you put them out for a minute? Let's have a little sidebar here. He said, listen, take heed what you guys intend to do to these men. Then he gave them some examples and he said, look, if this is of God, you can't overthrow it. In verse 39, you don't want to be found fighting against God. And they agreed, said, okay, sounds good. They called the apostles in, and even though they hadn't done anything wrong, they beat them. Laid them down, face down, stretched them out, beat them. How's that for not doing anything wrong? Let them up and sent them out. And it says the apostles went out rejoicing. So they're like, hey, uh, hey, 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 we were counted worthy to suffer for Jesus' name. They just got beaten in front of the council for being innocent. The council, as they watch him leave, are, you know, we're not reaching these guys. It was common. Look at Acts again, chapter 16. Paul and Silas go to Philippi. They're there doing ministry. People are getting saved. This demonically possessed girls following them around. Finally, Paul delivers her of the demon. People get upset. Who own her? They've lost the ability to get some revenue out of her. And so they drag them before the magistrates, give a false charge of what the problem is, and the magistrates don't even give them due process. They strip down their garments, lay them out, and they beat them apparently with rods, which is a great way to break your ribs. Throw them in jail, midnight they start singing. We see it there. Turn also, if you would, to 2 Corinthians 11. Paul is writing to the church at Corinth that God used him to plant. And yet he's having to explain to the church that he's really an apostle even though their lives have changed. How's that sound for messed up? So he gives them his resume. He says, listen, are they Hebrews? I am also. Seed of Abraham, so am I. Are they ministers of Christ? Verse 23, I speak as a fool, I'm more. Labors more abundant, stripes above measure, and prisons more frequent, deaths often. Here's his record, verse 24. Of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. He's had 195 lashes from the Jews over time. That's what they thought of his ministry. Probably dubbed him essentially a heretic and beat him. So I got 195 lashes out of the Jews. 
Thrice was I beaten with rods, usually done by the Romans, which means they have no limit, and it's a great way to break your ribs. Once was I stoned, you know that happened to him. Thrice I suffered shipwreck, night and a day, I've been in the deep. And then he goes on to talk about the other things that are a problem for him. False brethren, false Jews, thieves, robbers, and other issues. Now you're all waiting for me in Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. Just before this chapter, the scripture says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, thy God reigneth. And then he said, behold my servant. And he began to tell us about his servant. There's no form or comeliness we should desire him. Verse 3. He's despised, he's rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not, yet surely he has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement of our peace, the beating we deserve, was upon him, look at this, and with his stripes we are healed. How many stripes should a Jew receive? How many say 39? But who did the scourging? The Romans. Which means we don't know how many lashes he received. We talk about his death on the cross. His shed blood. That shed blood pays for our sins before God. It atones, kafar, it covers or atones our sins before God. But God also allowed him to be beaten. That's what we deserved. You know, those drugs that you sold to someone that ended up taking their life, that beating was on him. That person you misused terribly, that beating was on him. Those lies you told broke people's hearts or whatever the case may be. Those beatings were upon him. That disobedience you had to your parents, those beatings were upon him. He was willing to take what you and I deserve, both the publicly known sins as well as our secret sins. Those beatings were on him. And you think he doesn't love you? You think he doesn't have a plan for whatever difficulty you're in right now? Not sure if you're gonna have a job next Monday or whatever your thing you're facing right now? It says in Hebrews that the joy that was set before him, you, trusting him by faith, he endured the cross and despised the shame. But he received more than just a cross. He was wounded for our iniquities chastisement of our peace with God. He's paid the punishment. He got spanked in your place and died on your behalf. And all he asks is that you open your heart to him by faith. You ask him to come in and change your life. You turn away from sin as you've turned to Jesus and let him work in you. All he asks is that you would believe and prove your faith by letting him change you. What an amazing offer. And we so often skip over the idea that by his stripes we are healed. But those areas that have wounded you deeply that you know you did wrong, he paid for those and he'll even bring healing in those areas of your life where you know, not only do you grieve for those you harmed, but you grieve for how hard your heart used to be. These are the things he heals. But you have to let him in. You let him in, everything starts to change. We're out of time. Let's stand. Let's pray. Pick it up here next week. Father, thank you for your word. The more we see the law, the more we see we need Jesus. I do pray for anyone that doesn't know you. A lot of people say they want justice. I think the more we understand your level of justice, I, I just want salvation, forgiveness. 
It's right in front of you. But you have to bring it in. If you confess the Lord Jesus with your mouth as your Savior, you believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And the chastisement you deserve would be laid on him. Thank you for your love, Lord, and even thank you for your law because it reminds us what a wonderful Savior we have. In Jesus' name, amen.